Well, good morning. If you'd open your Bibles to John chapter 11, uh, we're going to look once again at this gospel narrative. If you're keeping track, we happen to be right at pretty much the midway point. When I finish up this morning, we'll be at the midway point through the book of John. But um, John's sequence of, of writing the Gospel of John is, is not strictly chrono chronological, as we've said before. And in fact, uh, starting next week, looking at John chapter 12, we'll actually be entering into the final week of the Lord Jesus' life. So John chooses to focus the last half of uh, his gospel narrative on the final uh, week of the Lord Jesus Christ. The first half of the book, John has been laying out his persuasive testimony, arguing for the case, trying to move his hearers, his readers, to the point of recognizing that Jesus Christ is something more than just another man. He's more than a prophet. He's more than a good teacher, that this one is the Son of God. Now, for us here, we pretty easily accept that and confess that, that Jesus is the Son of God. We think at Christmas time of the incarnation, that God came down, became flesh, and we really easily confess that as being true. But you know what? It shouldn't be easy for us. If we truly understand the depth of what that means. And I think perhaps in our day and age, we, we have an easier time of accepting that God became man because we have such a high view of man and we have really a diminished view of who God is. And so, my prayer, the purpose for which John writes this is that we would truly begin to get a grasp of the reality of Jesus Christ being God in the flesh and what that means to us and for us. So as I said, we are coming to the, the final uh, events of the narrative of John. We're also seeing and looking at this morning in John chapter 11, we are looking at the final miracle that John records for us. Surprising here in the last half of the book of John, um, we don't have any other major miracles. And so John has intentionally chosen certain miracles to set forth this argument and further this, this point that Jesus is the Son of God. And really, we're looking at the culmination, the, the focal point that John is drawing us to in the miracle that we will see today. The other thing we see here in this chapter is the final straw for the Jews. After this miracle, this sign that Jesus does, it is so clearly a testimony that he is more than a man. It is so disruptive to their theology and their understanding of, of how things are supposed to work that they commit themselves to destroying this one who shines so brightly in their midst. And so if you would, before we look at this text, would you bow your heads with me as we pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you, our Father, who is in heaven. And Father, we ask in faith that you would give us bread. Your Son teaches us that if we ask for bread, you will not give us a stone. If we ask for a fish, you did not give us a serpent. And so we ask, Lord, for bread this morning, not just physical bread and sustenance. Lord, we want to live spiritually. And so we ask, Lord, that you would give to us spiritual bread, that you would break your word. Your word is life. Your word is bread. And Father, may we consume, Lord, this morning your word. And may it come within us and bring forth life, Lord. May we come 
into a deeper knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ, and embrace him and find in him life. For it's for the sake of your glory that we pray. Amen. So John chapter 11, I'm going to be going from verses 1 down through 27. I'm going to be doing the setup, the, the opening of this miracle. Uh, ben is going to be taking the second half, and if you want really the conclusion, you need to stick around and hear that uh, for the Sunday school time. But we're in chapter 11, verse 1. I think we just could break this down in sections. We're going to look at this in seven sections. And the first section here is really the setup, the introduction of the characters. Now, a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother, Lazarus, was sick. Lazarus was sick. We're not told a whole lot about Lazarus. We don't know what type of sickness he had. We don't really know that much about his life. Lazarus, in this miracle, in this account, is not the focal character. He is not the focal point. John is not making a big deal out of his life. He is pointing to the one who is the big deal, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. But we do know a few things about Lazarus here. He lived in Bethany. Bethany was nearby Jerusalem. It was actually on the other side of the Mount of Olives, about two miles away from Jerusalem. Uh, Bethany was a frequent place for Jesus to lodge when he came up for the feasts to Jerusalem. He would often lodge outside of the city in the town, the village, suburb, if you would, of Bethany. Interesting enough, it's also the site of the ascension of the Lord Jesus. He went out of Jerusalem, and it was near Bethany where he ascended to heaven. Bethany, we are told, is the home of Mary and Martha. Very interesting the way this is laid out. Apparently, John was writing to people who would have been familiar with who Mary and Martha were. Another evidence that John is writing to believers John is writing to believers who have already most likely read through the other gospel accounts. And so he references Mary as the one who anointed Jesus and wiped her, his feet with her hair. But John doesn't get around to telling us that until the next chapter. So obviously he's speaking to people who have already read gospel accounts. We know a little about Mary and Martha's home. They were two most likely unmarried sisters. We don't read about any husbands, any children, any family other than these three siblings living together. We know that there was some tension in that home, right? There was some rivalry or some strained relationships between the sisters, Martha feeling like sometimes she was left with all the work. But the notable thing that we find out in this, this text about this home is that Jesus was there and that Jesus loved these individuals. You know, whatever our personal deficiencies, our problems might be, whatever status in life, whether married or single, children or childless, Whatever our condition is, the only thing that truly matters is our connection to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is what was noteworthy about this home and this family. And so we read here, verse 3, So the sisters sent word to him, that is Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. 
I find this section really fascinating, and we could just dig down right here in this section. First of all, we see the, the freeness and the boldness with which Mary and Martha sent to Jesus. If you remember, at the end of the last chapter, the Jews were attempting to stone Jesus, and Jesus slipped away, and he went across the Jordan. He was out in the wilderness in a secluded place. But somehow Mary and Martha knew where he was, and they sent word to him, and they had this urgent message, he whom you love is sick. They don't say, the one who loved you is sick. They say, he whom you love. Notice that the love of Jesus was very clear. And anybody who knows the Lord Jesus in a personal way knows this one truth. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible and the Holy Spirit the Lord Jesus himself tells me so. And so they said, the one whom you love is sick. And they knew that was enough of a message to strike a chord in the heart of their Lord, their friend, Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the love of God gives each of us great boldness to come before him with the deepest longings, the greatest problems, the greatest trials in our life, and just honestly lay before him our needs, our condition. It's striking in this passage how many times Jesus' love for these individuals is mentioned, as though John was making a point of this. John often referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And I believe I know that Jesus loved every one of his disciples, we could debate about Judas, but we know the love of Jesus, that it is rich, it is full, it is free towards each and every one of his children. But there was a unique love that Jesus had for these, these three. And I think the uniqueness has to do with the degree to which they relished in that love. You know, as parents, we love our children. But every parent knows that there are children who reciprocate more of their parents' love, and there are children who resist more their parents' love. And the love of God is like that, too, towards his children. Some of his children reciprocate that love, and some that he extends his love towards resist it. We read of a different instance where Jesus communicates the love that he has. In Luke 13, 34, Jesus is coming actually from Bethany back to Jerusalem. And he cries out and he says this, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. And you would not have it. Here the love of God was poured out towards his people, Jerusalem, the Israelites, the Jews, and yet they resisted that love. They opposed that love. But in Bethany, in the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, there was a unique enjoyment of the love of God. And so John testifies and says in verse 5, Now Jesus loved Martha, and her sister, and Lazarus. There was a display going on in that home of the love of God. It was evident. It was clear because that love was reciprocated. And so a question really comes to each and every one of us. Are we resisting or relishing the love of God? The love of God is immense, the love of God is real. The love of God is a love that surpasses in fulfillment anything else that we could look to to be satisfied in. And the invitation from the heart of God to each and every one of us is to relish, 
to thrive, to enjoy and know intimately that love. And Mary, Martha, and Lazarus had a unique enjoyment of the love of Jesus. In this section, too, we see an oxymoron. Now, you children know what an oxymoron is, don't you? An oxymoron are two statements that are put together that seem like they're complete opposites. So look at this passage, and do you see the two statements set side by side that seem like they have no, nothing to do with one another? Look at verse 5. Verse 5, we read this. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Verse 6, so when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed. He tarried two more days. Does that sound like love to you? It doesn't sound like love to me, not the love that I would think of, not the love that I would want. And yet, Jesus very clearly, in verse 4, tells us what his purpose was, what his intent was here. We might ask, how is this love? Sometimes we ask that in our own lives, don't we? The death of a loved one, financial problems, why do Christians suffer? How is this love? How can a loving God do this? Verse 4, Jesus says of Lazarus, when he heard this, he said, this sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. You know, it's difficult for us to accept that my personal comfort is not always God's primary aim. Because we look at things so temporally. Notice Jesus looks at the end result. What is the end? This, this sickness is not going to end in death. Well, Jesus, newsflash, Lazarus died. It looks like he ended in death. No, Jesus sees the end beyond the end, right? He sees what we cannot see. Isaiah says this in Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Isaiah says, remember the former things. Actually, this is God speaking through Isaiah. Remember the former things long past. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient time, things which have not been done. Saying, my purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. So here we have a crisis in our faith, and we face this quite often in our life. Do we trust that God is truly a good God? God knows the end. And if God is a good God, then everything he is working will end in what is absolutely most beneficially good for me and for his glory. And so God looks at this urgent message from Mary and Martha, and he sees, excuse me, Jesus looks at this urgent message from Mary and Martha, and Jesus, being God, sees the end, he sees what is ultimately good for Lazarus, and he lets him die. Because Jesus knows that this will result in an opportunity for God to be glorified in the life of Lazarus. And you know what? There is nothing greater in all of life there is no higher fulfillment for your life than that you should glorify God. That's your created purpose. That's the very reason that you were brought into this world, that you might, number one, glorify God, and number two, that you might enjoy his goodness forever. 
your highest fulfillment is found in glorifying God and enjoying that glory. And Lazarus was about to experience temporary death, but ultimately be example A in God's testimony that Jesus Christ is his son and thus glorify God. Wow, what an opportunity. You know, our problem is that we don't know all the facts. We don't know how things are going to end. And sometimes we just have to trust that God knows all that, right? And that God's will and God's purposes are what I would choose if I knew everything and I had a perfect moral character. God is God. So this oxymoron is not an oxymoron. Jesus loved Lazarus, and in his love, he allowed him to die because he intended through that to glorify his heavenly Father. Verse 7, then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go into Judea again. The disciples said to him, hold on, Jesus. Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. Are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. The disciples thought, you know, we need to remind Jesus of, you know, what is going on. Jesus, maybe you're getting ahead of yourself, maybe you're forgetting what the circumstances were. Maybe you didn't accurately read the crowds. They were trying to kill you. But Jesus is focused not upon what the crowds are relaying back to him, not how his message is being perceived, but on the fact that he has a work to do and he has a limited time to do that. You know, every one of us has a limited amount of time. We don't know how many more days we have. And God has a purpose for each and every one of your lives. And we need to be about that purpose. As God reveals it, as God shows us his will, we need to be doing it. Don't be putting it off. Because night is coming. There is a time in which that work can't be accomplished. And Jesus knew that his time was short. Verse 11, this he said, and after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may waken him out of sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Therefore, Thomas, who is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go so that we may die with him. You got to love Thomas's resolve. I'm going to follow Jesus. And if it means we die in a group massacre, let's do it. Let's follow Jesus. Let's commit. It's not normally what we think of Thomas. We remember Thomas for his questioning doubt. We call him Doubting Thomas, but here we see a very bold Thomas that is ready to follow Jesus. Jesus says uh, of Lazarus, Lazarus has fallen asleep. This is not the first time Jesus has referred to death as sleep. What's going on there? Is Jesus minimizing things? Is he being less than fully honest? Or is there a point here that Jesus is making that we as human beings miss? In fact, the New Testament picks up on this term of, of death as being fallen asleep when it refers to the death of believers. And Paul talks about those who have fallen asleep. So what, 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 is, what is Jesus' point in that? You know, as human be beings, as people... Death for us is something that is very final. It is that great thing that we fear out there. 
that great thing that we can't overcome or change. But Jesus, from a divine viewpoint, looks at physical death as a small, a transient problem, but spiritual death as the real obstacle to be feared and to be grappled with. And so when he says Lazarus is asleep, he is speaking about his physical death. Jesus came to deal with our greatest problem, and our greatest problem isn't the fact that every one of us, apart from the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, will face death. The greatest problem we have is not the fact that we are sinners and we need a cure for sin. The greatest problem that we have as people, as human beings, is that we are separated from the presence of God. We are separated relationally from God. I know that Christmas is right around the corner, but let's jump forward to the next holiday in February. Valentine's Day, just for a second. You husbands, if you are reading your calendars correctly, will go to the, the, the flower shop ahead of time and you will pick up some beautiful flowers which you are going to bring home to your sweetheart. Now when you pick up those flowers, unless they're potted, those beautiful cut roses you are bringing home to your wife a bunch of dead flowers. They're beautiful. You, she will take them and she'll put them in the vase. Their buds will be closed. And over the next several days, those flowers will open and she will enjoy the beauty and the aroma of those flowers. But in fact, those flowers are dead. And why are they dead? Because they're cut off from the plant. Now, it'll take some time for those flowers to fully manifest and show that they are dead, for those petals to start to shrivel and drop off. But that flower has been dead from the moment it was cut off from the vine or from the plant. We read in Genesis that God told Adam and Eve that they were not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that they eat of it, they will surely die. Well, if you read your Bible, Adam and Eve didn't die. In fact, Satan told them, you're not going to die. Did God get it wrong? No, the truth of the matter is that they died spiritually in the day that they ate of that fruit, the day that they disobeyed God. They were cut off relationally from God, and they were severed spiritually from God. It took a while for that death to fully manifest itself physically, for Adam and Eve to grow old and wither and die and return to the ground. But spiritually, the day that they sinned, they died. They were separated relationally from God. Physical death is not the obstacle that we see it as. The greatest detriment, the greatest danger to our lives is spiritual death. Death And Jesus is looking to that when he refers to death, physical death, as sleep. And we will pick up a little bit more as we progress in this text and wrap this up. Verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. I, I think this section is almost an oops section. It's the setup to what is going to happen. And it's not a pretty setup. Look at these verses. Verse 17. Jesus came. He found that Lazarus had already been dead four days. He found that. Like, oops, maybe I should have come a little sooner. But there's another oops here too. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Why is that a problem? In the last chapter, we read the Jews were going to stone Jesus. They were committing to themselves to killing Jesus. So not only had Jesus shown up too late to do much of anything for Lazarus, I mean, 
We have some evidence in the Old Testament of people being raised from the dead, but it was pretty shortly after they had perished, after they had expired. Here, Lazarus had laid and decomposed in the, in the Mediterranean grave for four days. Not a pretty sight. Not a lot of hope. And beyond that, he walks into a hostile environment. A good Norwegian would say, oofta. <laughs> Verse 20, Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would, have, would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Here we have Martha coming to Jesus. This tender, this very vulnerable, this very emotional moment as she comes to Jesus... Her heart is in anguish. She feels just a little bit of remorse that Jesus had not come sooner, and yet Jesus is the master and the teacher. And how do you question the master and the teacher? And in this moment, in this vulnerable moment, the reality of Martha's theology or understanding who Jesus is is, is fully revealed. In three statements. Number one, she says, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, if you've been following along in our study of John, in chapter 4, we know that distance is not a limiting factor to the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Remember the royal official who sent to Jesus said, my son is sick. And Jesus said, go, your son is well. And he healed him from a great distance. So distance was not a limiting factor. And Martha said, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Secondly, she assumes that Jesus being there would have prevented this death. In other that, words, that it was God's will that her brother live. And we already looked at verse 4 where Jesus said very clearly that his death, his illness, was to result in the glory of God, that God had a purpose in the sequence of, of events. So Mary's faith was limited by several things that she hadn't quite yet fully grasped and internalized about the truth of who Jesus was. Secondly, she says, even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. I don't know what exactly Martha was driving at there. If she was asking Jesus for the resurrection because she seems to not believe it's possible in her next statement. But she says, I know that whatever you ask of God, and apparently in the Greek, this is an interesting word that she uses here. She uses the word of an inferior asking of a superior for something. She refers to Jesus as someone who is inferior to God, the Father, as though Jesus were a prophet, as though Jesus were just a good man asking of the Heavenly Father. Jesus, I know you have some inside track with God. If you ask God, God listens to you. So Martha's understanding of who Jesus was had not fully developed to where Jesus had already explained or Jesus had already taught that I and the Father are one, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, she says, I know that he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. This is her third statement, theological statement, and Jesus challenges her and pushes her a little bit on this statement. He, he grows, I know that's not good English, but he, he matures her understanding of the resurrection.
She says, I know that in the last day there will be a resurrection. And Jesus tells her, no, there is right now a present reality of the resurrection, a certainty of the resurrection. And let's jump into this final section and see the words of Jesus. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, and you see a growth in her understanding of who Jesus is. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection. Literally, that means the Greek word there, a standing up, a raising up. I am the resurrection. As a result of the fall, we became spiritually dead, even though we're physically alive. And Jesus states here that he is the one who lifts us up spiritually. John chapter 3, he who believes in me will be born again. He will become spiritually alive again. Jesus says, I am the resurrection. And not only that, I am the life. We could say that through Jesus we have eternal life. But even that would be an insufficient theological statement. Let me ask you this question. Is your theology growing? Theology is just your study and knowledge of God. Is your theology a growing theology? Are you growing in your knowledge of God? You see every one of the people Jesus walked with being challenged in their theology. A static theology, a static understanding of God is a dead understanding of God. If you have a real relationship with God, God is going to continually challenge you to grow in your understanding of who he is. That's because God is a big God. And there's no way that any of us in our structures of understanding can fully encompass him. And we're continually being stretched in our understanding to begin to grasp the vastness of who God is. If we have any relationship with God, you're going to be challenged in your understanding of who God is. And Mary is being stretched and challenged. So I said, if we say that through Jesus Christ we have life, that is really not what Jesus is getting at. He says, I am the life. By taking hold of and embracing me, you have life. Remember that rose. Separated from the plant, it is a dead rose. But if that rose were to be grafted back in to the plant, it might, by the grace of God, be once again a living rose. And you and I must find that in Jesus Christ is life. By embracing him, by being grafted and taking hold of him, there is life. And so Martha's understanding of who Jesus was, of who God is, was stretched and grown as she came to embrace wholly this one who was life. John states very clearly the purpose that he is writing this gospel. He says, These things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That is what this is all about. That is what this book, this book 
Gospel of John, the entire book of the Bible is all about, that we might have life in him. Would you pray with me?